Hi, welcome back to the Dr. O'Donovan Medicine Made Easy YouTube channel. My name is James O'Donovan. I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of Oxford in Global Health and I was previously an Academic Foundation Programme Doctor in Cambridge between 2015 and 2017. This video is going to be for anyone who's interested in the Academic Foundation Programme, whether you're a third year medical student thinking about a career as a clinician scientist through to final year medical students who are putting in their applications at the moment. I'm going to cover everything from what is the Academic Foundation Programme through to what you need to be doing to try and maximise your chances of securing a post through to what to do when you secure, hopefully secure an interview. Now, the reason I'm putting this video together is because I've been made aware that there are people who are creating packages or courses, trying to sell these to other medical students in order to maximize or potentially maximize the chance of securing a post. Now, I should make it very clear that I secured a post and never attended one of these courses. I know dozens of colleagues who also secured posts who never attended one of these courses, and all the information you need is freely available online, or you just need to approach one of the junior doctors in the hospital where you're doing rotations who is on an academic foundation program and ask them a little bit about it. Everyone who is on an academic foundation program, or most people I would hope, would be more than happy to talk to you. So my advice is if you're thinking of going on one of these courses that I've been made aware of in the last couple of days, save your money. You do not need to go on it. I've included everything you need to know in the description box of this video. So books, websites, other videos. If you read those, practice interviews with your colleagues or your family or your friends, you'll be more than prepared. And I wish you the very best of luck in trying to secure a post. It's also important to note that if you don't secure an academic foundation program job, that isn't the end of your potential academic career. This is just a starting point. There's loads of opportunities to get involved in academic training later on in your training. Um, obviously, it's great if you secure one, but don't give up hope and think that this is the be all and end all. It most certainly isn't, um, but I hope this video is gonna help in maximizing your chances of securing a post. So let's switch to Black Blackboard and I can explain to you where the Academic Foundation Programme sits within clinician scientist training. Okay, so let's have a look at how integrated academic training is structured in the UK. This is really useful to know about because it gives you an idea of what you're getting yourself into and also it gives you an idea of the structure of the pathway that you need to be looking at or thinking about if you're interested in being both a doctor and a researcher. This is something that I didn't really know much about when I was starting medical school and I wish I'd known a little bit more about it. You also will probably be asked about this in your Academic Foundation Programme interview. So you guys will be at this stage now, which is medical school. And in your final year of medical school, around October, November time, you're going to submit an application to the foundation programme. And separate to that, if you want to do the academic foundation programme, you can put in a separate application. And we'll talk about all the things you need to do to strengthen that application later in the video. But essentially, this was designed to give junior doctors a flavour of research. So if you think you might have an inkling towards a, a career, as a doctor and a researcher, this was a good time to get a flavour of that. And typically, you do a four month placement in academic foundation year two. So instead of doing another clinical job, so typically F1 is split into three blocks. So you do a four month job here, a four month job here, four month job here, and again, three blocks here, you do a four month job, four month job, four month job. These are always clinical jobs. But instead of doing a clinical job, you have an academic block where you can go do research. Now, after this, you usually go into higher training. So let's take surgery as an example. During your foundation year two, you apply for higher training. So if you want to become a surgeon, you would have to go do CT1 and 2 of surgery, so core training 1 and 2, where you get your basic foundations of surgery. And then you apply for an ST3 or a specialist registrar post. So let's take plastic surgery as an example. You decide at the end of F2 you want to become a plastic surgeon, and so you apply to core training one and two, you do that over a period of two years, and then you decide I'm going to apply and become a registrar in plastic surgery. And again, there's a competition element at this stage. Now you may decide, actually, I want to be both a researcher and a plastic surgeon, and so you would apply for something called an academic clinical fellowship. 
Now, this is at the same stage, so you apply for this at the end of F2, or you can apply for it basically at the break here, but let's just say you apply for it at the end of F2, and you secure one of these ACFs. Now, what this means is that instead of doing your CT1 and 2, and then applying again competitively at this point to go and do ST3, instead, you secure an ST1 in plastic surgery, and you still do what essentially is core training as a plastic surgeon for one and two, but then instead of applying competitively again to get an ST3 post, this step is eliminated. So you've already got a run through post. And so in competitive specialties like plastic surgery or orthopedics, actually doing research, if you're genuinely interested in that, can take away that element of competition and stress again applying for this higher specialty training post. And it also means that typically you get to stay in one region. So you're going to apply for this academic clinical fellowship, say in the East Anglia region, and then you'll stay in that training all the way through until you get something called your CCT, your Certificate of Completion of Training. And that's the point you're going to be a consultant. Now say you're interested in this academic career, after F2, your academic F2, you can go and get your academic clinical fellowship. Typically, this gives you three years of protected time to do some research during that training. And during that time, you'd be building up your fellowship in order to get your PhD fellowship. And at this point here, you typically, the way that the system was designed was that you do your PhD at this point or your higher degree like an MD. And then hopefully at the end of that, you'd secure a clinical lectureship. And at this point, you're essentially at your registrar training and you'd be doing 50% academic time and 50% clinical time. So you'd be a researcher half the time and you're doing your um, medical job as a doctor half the time. And at the end of this, hopefully you'd get your CCT, which we talked about here. And at this point, you'd be appointed by a university, usually on a university contract as a senior lecturer or a consultant. And this is the point where you're going to be applying for those big clinical scientist awards from places like the MRC, so the Medical Research Council or Wellcome Trust. Now, what's important to note is that you don't need to have done an academic foundation program job here in order to progress to an academic clinical fellowship here. It's not a point where if you've missed this boat, you can't get on to this point and this point. No, you can also apply at this point here, or you may decide, look, I've already got a PhD. I did that when I was at medical school. I don't necessarily need to do the academic foundation program, and I don't need to do the academic clinical fellowship. I'll just do my normal foundation program one and two. I'll do my normal core training. And then at this point, when I'm going into higher specialty training, I'll apply for a clinical lectureship program. So hopefully that's given you a good idea as to how academic training is structured in the UK. And um, now we'll move on and think about how you can be applying to the Academic Foundation Programme and things that might strengthen your application. Right, so hopefully you've now got a better idea of what the Academic Foundation Programme is and where it sits within training. Now let's look at what you need to be doing to maximise your chances of securing one of these posts. Now, in October, you typically put together your application for the foundation program. And aside from that, separate to that, if you're interested in the AFP, you put together a separate application. And typically, there's some white space answers, usually five to six questions around your motivations for applying. Now, in order to strengthen your application, I would advise you, if you're in early enough stage, to think about four key things. So those are previous degrees or other degrees, publications, prizes, and presentations. Now, in terms of other degrees, there are two main opportunities that I can think about to secure a couple of points on the application process. The first is if you already have a degree. If you're a graduate entry medical student and you're applying to the AFP, you've already secured your degree, you're gonna probably get some extra points for that. Now, if you're currently a medical student, say you're a first, second, third, fourth year medical student, and you think, okay, I might be interested in research as a career, and there's something that I really want to do at the moment, you can do something called an intercalated year. That's typically where you take a year out of medical school, and you can do either a master's in research, you could do a bachelor's in anatomy. You can essentially do, do any degree you want that's approved by the medical school, and you will also secure points for that. Um, 
quick bit of advice would be don't go and do a degree to secure points for the academic foundation program you will be extremely miserable throughout the year if you go and do that um, and you should only do it if you genuinely are really passionate about a certain area of study Now the next area that we can talk about is publications. You will secure points on the application if you have peer-reviewed publications. Now, there are a couple of ways to think about publications. I like to think of it as a tier, so you've got high quality randomized control trials at the top of that tier. Those are really useful to, for the general field of science and they're gonna be really good in terms of your future applications. Then there's things that are lower hanging fruits that are easier to access as a medical student because remember doing a research project and eventually publishing it takes so much time you have to design the study get ethics run the study analyze the results publish it ultimately get rejections from journals respond to the rejections and then hopefully get it accepted that whole process will take you i would say a minimum depending on the project but a minimum of a year now Sometimes that's not gonna be feasible. You guys are already busy as medical students. So what can you be doing to get other publications? Now, something I did when I was a medical student was to read journals, journals that I was genuinely interested in. And I would find potentially controversial articles or articles which I didn't necessarily agree with myself. And I would write a letter to the editor. And now a letter to the editor sometimes get, gets indexed on PubMed. And so you will get a title on PubMed of your article with your name beneath it and a PubMed ID. Now, you have to remember that publishing a letter to the editor is not the same as doing a, you know, original randomized research, original RCT. Um, they're very different things. Publishing a letter to the editor could take you one evening to write. But if you need to secure points, that's one way to do it. Other things you could be doing are systematic literature reviews. You could do one of those as your student selected component. Um, basically, anything that will get you a publication is really helpful. Um, I know there'll be some pushback and some people will be saying, oh, we shouldn't be encouraging students to chase publications. And we could argue about this all day, but at the end of the day, in order to secure a post, in order to maximize your chances of securing a post, it's good to potentially have a couple of publications next to your name. It's not gonna hurt. So when I do something, I like to do something A, I enjoy, B, that I think will actually be of benefit to the general wider scientific community. And I also like to do something that I can hit multiple points on. So instead of just doing something for a publication, well, if you've already done the research project, you may as well submit it to an international conference or national conference or local conference and present that work. And then you may as well submit it for a prize. And you may be surprised that not many people actually apply to some of these national prizes. So the Royal Society of Medicine, for example, run dozens of medical student prizes each year, and they have them in loads of different sections. So they have them in respiratory medicine, obs and gyne, urology, even e-health and m-health. So if you've done a research project, I would encourage you to also submit that for a prize. Your medical schools generally always run prizes. Those usually range from say a book voucher or a 50 pound um, or 100 pound reward, but you, they will be out there. The other place to look is the Royal Society of Medicine and there's also all the professional organizations. So for example, the British Orthopedic Trainees Association or BAPRAS, which is the Plastic Surgeons Association, they'll all have prizes available for medical students. So if there's a particular specialty you're interested in, check out their Royal Society or their professional group webpage and look on the medical student section under prizes, grants, awards, and you'll typically find something there. If you've done something already, why not go ahead and submit it?
So I would encourage you, if you've done any kind of project at medical school, if it's been a teaching project or if it's been a research project, if it's something you think other people could learn from, even if you've done a student selected component, turn that into a 250 word abstract and submit that to a conference. It could be a student conference, it could be a local or regional conference, it could be an international conference. Obviously the international conferences are going to secure more points and be viewed as more highly, but I would encourage you just to, at an early stage, target something that is more accessible, gives you the opportunity to practice creating a poster or an oral presentation, and that way you can go and present your work and get feedback on it. So those are the four things that I would say would really strengthen your application. Previous degrees or other degrees, um, publications, prizes or presentations and hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea as to what to be doing in order to secure those. Now once it comes to then submitting the application, you'll submit it, you'll wait for a while and you'll hear back from the deaneries and usually you can apply to two different deaneries. So I applied to Cambridge and then I also applied to Oxford. Now, when it comes to making a decision around applying to the deaneries, think about a couple of things. Think about, do you want to live in that place for the next two years? If you don't, don't apply, because you will ultimately be much more happy being somewhere that you actually want to live. Don't go because it's a prestigious deanery or because you think that's the place you should be. Go because you actually want to be there. Also think about how the Academic Foundation Programme in that deanery is structured. So for example, in Newcastle, you can do a foundation, academic foundation program where you get four months in AF1, and then you get four months in AF2. Whereas in Cambridge, where I was, I just got four months in AF2. The other thing is to think about, is the program structured where you get day release each week, or is it structured on a block of four months? Typically it's a block of four months, and I found that really useful, but other people wanted to do day release. So find out from that particular deanery how their academic foundation program is structured. In order to do that, all you need to do is email the deanery advisor. There'll be the foundation program director at every deanery. Just shoot off an email, you'll find it online to them and ask them the questions if they're not online. They'll be more than happy to get back to you. Otherwise, get make a Twitter account and post it on Twitter and you will find that people will respond to you with your questions. Cambridge was really good. They had a budget which you had to apply for competitively in order to go present your research at another place. And I managed to secure one of those awards. Um, that was really helpful to just go and present my research work. And it was a real bonus because to go and present my work was 750 pounds. That's almost a third of your junior doctor salary each month, but that was a real bonus. So find out about those things because they are important. And if you are interested in an academic career later on down the line, having presentations next to your name is really helpful. Otherwise, they also some deaneries also offer teaching courses. So they offer postgraduate certificates in education. So have a think about how their program is structured and what other benefits come along with it. And you'd be surprised at all the other things that are available to you. Most of it, again, is available online. So just do a good internet search and you'll typically find it. Otherwise, ask people on Twitter or just find the local foundation program doctors in your deanery and ask them the questions. Now, once it's come to deciding where you want to be, so you've thought about the location, you've thought about the structure of the program, my other tip here would be to email a supervisor. Find a supervisor early on and fire them off an email and say, hello, my name is, so for example, I would say, hi, my name is James. I'm currently a final year medical student thinking about applying to the Academic Foundation Programme and I have previously undertaken work in neuroimaging. I've done a master's degree in neuroimaging and I've spent a year abroad at Harvard on a fellowship undertaking research on that. I've published a number of papers Here's my CV. I was wondering if you might be interested in supervising me, should I be successful in securing an academic foundation program? That's a really good way to find out who your potential supervisor is going to be and have an idea of the kind of project you might be doing. And the reason that is good is because A, it gives you time to set up a project or apply for ethics, 
and B, when it comes to interview, it shows the interviewers you've been keen and find, found out about the supervisors or potential projects in that deanery and you're really keen on going there. Now some people might, may say oh, it's kind of presumptuous that you're already emailing supervisors but I would say preparedness is really good and it also shows that you're enthusiastic about that place and you've really done your research into finding out what's available. So I'll give you guys an idea of the interviews by talking about my own experience. So I attended Oxford and Cambridge for my interviews. In Cambridge, I turned up to Addenbrooke's, which is the hospital, and there were three people on the interview panel. The first set of questions, which lasted for about 15 to 20 minutes, were all about my um, research experience, past research, research experience, what, why I was keen on going to Cambridge, um, the kind of project I was interested in. That's where it was really helpful to have already contacted the supervisor and the feedback from the panel was really good on that. Um, and it was also about, did I know about research design? Did I know about the structure of the um, clinician scientist training? So did I know about the academic foundation program, the academic clinical lectureships, all the way through to full lectureships? So know about that, that's really helpful. And then the next part of the interview was just about basic clinical emergencies. So I had um, dealing with anaphylaxis as one and dealing with a patient with an MI as another. And I would say for this, all you need to do is get the Oxford Clinical Handbook, look at the emergency section at the back, and if you know all of those um, emergency scenarios, you'll be fine. It's also great re revision for your you know, final year exams and also for your future job as a junior doctor as an F1 and F2 because you'll be dealing with these medical emergencies. So none of this is a waste of time. and It's also great prep. So that was my Cambridge interview and obviously that went well because I secured a post. Now, my Oxford interview was after Christmas. I'd been to the States um, over Christmas. I got back and I was super tired, really jet lagged. My interview's in the morning. I'm not a morning person anyway. Um, we went to the Kassam Stadium, which is the Oxford United Football Stadium. You waited around in the waiting room and I always hate these things because I think putting a group of medics who are already highly strong people in one room who are all competing for a post just makes for a bad um, recipe. People were like flexing on each other saying, oh, I've done this amount of stuff. They were trying to psych each other out. I would say just turn up, put some headphones in and ignore everyone else. That would be my advice. Um, so yeah, I would say I was a little bit flustered at the start and looking back six years ago, like hindsight's a great thing. I would have just ignored all that. Yeah, I would just say, focus on yourself and just try your best. So I went into the interview and this was split in two rooms. So my first interview was with two people. I assume they were professors or other doctors and they asked me about a research project I'd done and then they also asked me about a recent paper I'd read and I just for some reason totally blanked I couldn't remember a paper I'd read I mean I'd read dozens but just one didn't come to mind but they then asked me questions around the study design what did I think were the strengths and limitations of the paper how would I have designed the study differently and to be honest I just feel like I performed really badly in this interview I just was having a bad day and I mean it was fine but it then made me more flustered for my next interview in the next room which was with two junior doctors and they were essentially running the clinical side of the interview and they again presented two scenarios to me I think one was a pneumothorax and I think the other was a PE I think going from the poorly performing academic interview over into the clinical interview or carried that negative energy with me I would just say throw that away and go in and try and perform your best in the clinical scenario and um, something I'd say is go back to the A B C D E procedures so you know airway breathing circulation go back to that if you're ever flustered and try work your way through that sy systematically that's really helpful for the clinical interview um, and so yeah those two things happened went to Cambridge went to Oxford did better at the Cambridge interview didn't do as well at the Oxford one I was actually waitlisted in Oxford surprisingly so sometimes even when you think you're you've performed really badly maybe you've actually not performed as badly as you think you have but in the end I ended up accepting the Cambridge program now once you've accepted the program this is where things get interesting you've been offered the job it's fantastic you're excited now you need to think about actually what project you're going to do. Now something that I wish I'd thought about a little bit more was where did I do that block 
Did I do it in the first four months of F2, the next four months or the final four months? I ended up doing it in the final four months for a couple of reasons. Number one, I thought I was going to be super tired and burnt out by the end of F1 and F2 and I just wanted some time away from clinical medicine to have a little bit of downtime and thinking space because when I do research I really feel like I can think and have room to think. The other reason was because I wanted to have time to get the ethics approval for the project at the start of F2 and make sure it was all in place for that final project. Now I have other friends who did it at the very beginning of F2 because they wanted some time out after F1 in order to get their project going and they also wanted to make sure that whatever project they did they could use the publications or presentations for their higher and specialist training program. I already knew that I wasn't going to be going straight into higher specialist training because I wanted to go and do the PhD afterwards so that wasn't really so much of a concern for me but it's useful to think about when you do that um, block for various reasons. Other people like to use their time not only to do their research but to study for some professional exams. So yeah thinking about when you're going to do the project is also interesting and then getting stuff set up like getting your ethics approval, making sure your supervisor's on the same page as you as to when you're going to be doing the project. Um, all those things are really helpful to think about once you've secured the post and also remember that sometimes when you do your academic foundation program job you might be in a one hospital for the first year where you're not necessarily based for the second year in a different hospital which is where you're going to be doing the project. So for example for me I was in Peterborough for one year and my final project in the second year was in Cambridge and so in order to set that up some days on my off days in F1 I was driving down or getting the train down to Cambridge to meet with my supervisor for the next year to get everything set up. Now I'm sure that I've not covered everything and you guys are gonna have questions. If you do, post them in the comments section below. Any question I am happy to answer within reasonable means. Um, but yeah, any question or anything that you've thought of during this video, just post it in the section below, I'll get back to you. I've also posted loads of books, websites, other videos in the description section of this video. Hopefully that is gonna be useful. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope it's going to be useful. And remember, be confident. Don't feel like you need to pay the money to go on one of these courses. Just use the resources that are available online. Look at the person's specification and try hit some of those boxes for points. If you don't, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. And put your hat in the ring, have a go. It might be a really useful experience. You might not have been interviewed since your medical school interview and this could be a great practice interview. Um, and it can also make you think about where your areas of that you can improve on are. So it might make you realize, okay, I do want to be a clinician scientist, but I've not actually published anything. Maybe I should start thinking about doing a research project that I'm interested in and getting a mentor or supervisor in order to help me maybe secure an academic post later down the line. Thanks again and good luck in your applications.